thank you for coming. Um, my name is Michael. I am an educational technologist at the center. And um, welcome to our presentation on presentations today. Um, working on this workshop, or this presentation, has been a real sort of labor of love for me because uh, I came to Columbia first as a student. And as a student, um, this is a great way for me to give a little back to my uh, alma mater. Um, because I came here, then the main reason I came to Columbia was because of you, because of uh, I wanted to study with you, hear your stories and your experiences. So this is a great way for me to sort of blend what I do at my work and with what I'm learning at uh, Teachers College. So um, let me be. So, let me tell you a little bit about my story, about why I thought about this as a presentation was. As a student, um, what I found was while my instructors were great at lecturing in the classroom, when it came time to give us some supplemental materials, mostly in PowerPoint, I found that they weren't as engaging as they were. And it caused me to think a little bit about why that was, because, it's the, because the lectures were great, the content was great, but I started to think that maybe it was the tool itself in PowerPoint. Maybe there was something inherent in PowerPoint that wasn't able to tap into the, um, the value and of what my teachers were trying to tell me or teach. So it brought me on this path of looking at some other tools and how to use PowerPoint a little differently. So if I could be so bold, I'd like to use PowerPoint to sort of, with a sort of critical eye, on PowerPoint and look at a few ways that we might be able to use PowerPoint a little differently. So here's my argument. Here's my, my story here. We have always been wired for visual communication. And we have developed this understanding of visual communication or media literacy for a very, very long time. Right? From the caves of Lasso to the Egyptian hieroglyphs to stories of God in stained glass. Um, you could be illiterate or literate and understand what's going on with, this, with these um, stories in glass. Art, of course, always tells a story. Or not always, but sometimes tells a story. Um, maps, which I think are a great way to tell a story. So um, what you have in a map are pictures and words, but telling the story of either conquest or armies or travel, adventure, empire. There's a lot of way, stories that a map tells with pictures and words. To tapestries, where people would spend time to put their stories into cloth so others would be able to, they'd be able to share them with others. Um, to the storybook. So <clears throat> if, I think that this is where we, most of us started to read, to learn how to read. We would look at the pictures, someone else would say the words, and we would assimilate those two things in our minds, in our imaginations, and, tell, and come up with stories. Um, as we grow older, grew older, we started to do that ourselves. So we were able to read the text and read the pictures in a way that made sense to us and sort of brought us into a, a, we were able to sort of in our imaginations put those two together. We are really wired for pictures and words together, I think. Um, and then in the film. And we've created this whole media literacy around decades of watching film. We know, for instance, in this scene from Vertigo, that Jimmy Stewart, even though his eyes are open, is about to enter into a dream. So how do we know that? Well, we know that because we have built a literacy around film, right? We know that through images and text, uh, shadow and light, that the director is trying to elicit some kind of story. He's trying to say something with these. Um, what's also interesting, I think, about Hitchcock is that he never waited for the technology to catch up. So he, if he had an idea, he used the tools at his disposal in ways for his story. And he didn't take the tools and say, well, this is the only way I could use them. And I think that that's what we do sometimes with PowerPoint. And I'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, of course, the comic is another way of putting words and pictures together. And again, we've, we've built the literacy. So you know, we know that this square 
means that that's a narration, right? We know that the um, bubbles are, are people thinking, and, and these are actual stated texts, right? There's some advertising in this, so we've always been, always been able to mix our mediums together, right? Here's an ad, of, and of course this is actually words, or text as words, I mean text as pictures, right? So we're able to use pictures and words together to elicit some kind of meaning. And of course when we have something really important that we want to say, we know how to put words and pictures together on a screen to elicit emotion. We know this, we feel this, right? And then I, I come up to the website, which is basically the story of someone's desk. It's got his loved ones there, personal, um, interesting places to go. It's a website, but it's really a story. It's a personalized journey through this person's day. So what I think is that we've built throughout the decades, we've formed this literacy of all these different mediums and we know how they work together, we know what works and doesn't work, but at the same time, running parallel to that, we've developed this PowerPoint literacy and it really doesn't have much to do with the other mediums. And I call it a literacy because if it wasn't a literacy, then so many PowerPoints we make wouldn't look so similar. They're similar for a reason, that we're making them based on other people's PowerPoints, and that's the literacy that we've developed. So what I would like to see is somehow that we could get the PowerPoint into that media umbrella. So when we, try, when we think about making a presentation, we might look to film or advertising or the, or the book or any other medium to make our presentations a little bit more like storytelling and a little easier to understand and enjoy. So I think it's a sort of a three-pronged approach. We already have this media literacy that we've been developing for a long, long time. Maybe we could hone it a bit, but we all, in one way or another, know what works and doesn't work. <clears throat> and throughout the last few years, we've also learned a lot about learning, right? So we know what works, and we know the best ways to structure things for learning. So why not apply some of those principles to our presentations, right? <laughs> And of course, the web is exploding with new tools. So we have all these new tools at our disposal. And my thinking is, if we could somehow mesh these three together, that we could have much more effective presentations, OK? And we could try to get away from what we are doing now in PowerPoint, where we have a lot of lists and bullets, a lot of information up there. Uh, a lot of complex charts, a lot of bulleted lists, okay? Um, really dense statistical data that we're trying to make clear in a slide. And I just want to say that and none of these slides I've put up here for any type of ridicule, um, these are the norm. This is how we create our PowerPoints. This is how we do it. Um, so they're not to be sort of, you know, looked at. The question is, why do we create them this way? And of course, oh, this one I might have put up for a little ridicule. Um, I, this is really, to me, this is the epitome of where we're going with PowerPoint. I mean, the idea of connecting two concepts with a curved line that goes around another concept really cognitively is almost impossible to try to understand. So it seems to me that this is this is bad PowerPoint taken to a, a certain degree where we're trying to get too much information in one place at one time and the brain just can't um, handle that. That's yeah, yeah, hopefully it got better and not worse. <laughs> convey complexity. Uh-huh, yes. Uh-huh, thank you. Uh, so a little bit about how, where I stand in, in this. If we were to, for the sake of argument, break up PowerPoint into three different camps. Um, we have the people here on the left, like Edward Tufte, designers who believe that PowerPoint is completely corrupting and it corrupts any material that goes into it. It does way more damage than it does good. 
I happen to like Edward Tufte very much, but that's the extreme side of it. Of course, there's the other side. <clears throat> um, people at Microsoft, people who've created PowerPoint, people who believe that PowerPoint out of the box is a great thing because all those defaults are taking the load off of you. So you don't have to worry about the design of your presentations. We'll leave that, you can leave that up to us. All you have to worry about is your content. So we're gonna make this easy for you and that's why you should use the defaults. Then there's this group in the middle, cognitive psychologists and professors who think that PowerPoint is, could be useful and effective if used in a certain way. I happen to fall into this camp. As a technologist myself, I see PowerPoint as a tool first and foremost. So for me, it's about taking the tool to fit my needs, not trying to force my needs into a tool. And with a little tweaking, I think PowerPoint is fine. I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's, um, for many of you, it's a first step towards, um, educational technology in, in a way of like you're taking your content and you're making files out of it and I think that's a great start um, but I think there's a lot of ways that we could work with PowerPoint or use some other things which I'll show you a little later I'll let you read this for a second so before I uh, talk about the content, let me just talk about the structure of this slide. First of all, it's in italics. So usually in ital italics means that something's being quoted. And that's part of the literacy that we've grown to know. So, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so italics for quotes, it's a purpose for the italics. Secondly, I didn't read it to you because um, actually what we've learned in, in recent times is that me, if I were to recite something that you're reading, it's actually redundant and, and not reinforcing in any way. I'm actually making you work harder if I read it while you read it, okay? So from now on, I usually, if something's to be read, I'll let you, the viewer, read it yourself. And in terms of the content, uh, this was very disheartening for me to read because it made me realize that there are so many teachers out there, and this is a professor who I happen to admire very much, that they need to sort of bulletize or simplify content in order to make it fit into PowerPoint as opposed to letting PowerPoint be the tool that helps them. It's forcing people to change their, the structure of their content to fit into PowerPoint and that can't be a good thing. Which uh, brings me to the default structure of PowerPoint. And it seems that PowerPoint is set up for you to add quickly content in a topic, subtopic um, architecture or structure. I think that's a little strange for a few reasons. One, it's really not the best way for us to learn cognitively. It never was. PowerPoint never claimed it to be. The interesting about this slide or this structure is that um, in the 80s, when the people of PowerPoint were, were looking for, it was very difficult for people to embed images in slides in the 80s, to put words and pictures together. So the people at PowerPoint decided that they created this sort of bulleted structure, which is really easy to do because the bullet is just another character. So this is just a screen of characters. But in a way, it creates this sort of conceptual pic picture almost of the data. And I think that was a great innovation on PowerPoint's um, part in the 80s to, to make it so the slides could look a certain way. But 30 years later, with PowerPoint going on endless upgrades and innovations, this is still the structure that they give to you. So it's very strange to me how, why this is still the way that we, it's a sort of a chicken and egg type of dilemma. I mean, is PowerPoint simply providing a need because we all want to use bullets, they make it easy for us to use bullets? Or are we all using bullets because PowerPoint is giving it to us? I probably think it lies somewhere in the middle. Nothing's really black and white. So um, a little bit has to do with 
us being just doing what everyone else does and at the same time PowerPoint saying this is how we're going to do it. And again, and with templates, um, we use templates a lot in our PowerPoints and I'm not sure exactly why. Why use up so much of that real estate? If you were an artist and this were a canvas, why wouldn't you use the whole canvas? Why would you just use up two thirds of the canvas? What do you, what do you lose with a template when you gain uniformity? I could see uniformity maybe in a corporate setting. Maybe you're being told that your slides have to look a certain way. But in academia, why not go and use the whole slide? Why, uh, why limit yourself and try to force your content into a smaller space and f change the structure of it by putting it into bullets? And this is real. So I found this on the web <clears throat> among thousands of other um, PowerPoints done by kids. So it really shows <clears throat> the permeation of how this culture has permeated down, or how this structure has permeated through our culture, where our, even our young um, are creating their work in PowerPoint. The thing about this slide is, <clears throat> I could assume that this little boy or girl read Charlotte's Web, but I can't tell if they liked it or hated it or cared at all about the book. And I think if you were to give me one paragraph from a little boy or girl, I'd be able to tell if they liked it or not. And you could give me 50 slides and I would never know if that p person liked this book. So it kind of says something about the structure of the bullets and the simplification of language, which I don't think has a place in academia, especially at a place like Columbia, where the, the content is so rich and complex and, and takes a lot to understand. I don't know if this is our best way to, to alter it. So let me just look at a few cognitive principles, <clears throat> things that are very basic that we might find easy to implement in our own presentations, okay? So we have these two channels. Okay, we're perfect for words and pictures. We take in info from our ears, we take in info from our eyes. We assimilate that together in our memory, working memory, it stores in our long-term memory. The key though is, you know, pictures and words are much better together, okay? We have a limited capacity for each of those channels, right? <clears throat> We could only put so much information into one of those channels. I would love to talk to you all about all that stuff right now, but I can't tell you about all those things in the next, on this slide or in the next five minutes. It takes a while. I can't overburden you with too much information per slide. So, because we have this limited capacity for how much we could take in. And we always engage in active processing, okay? So what we do is we take in information, we blend that information with what we have already, we create new ideas, new experiences, okay? It's not like a computer hard drive where we could just take information from a slide and store it in our brain. Our brains just don't work like that. So basically the multimedia principle is that we learn better from pictures and words together than by words alone. This is why a description of how a pump works just in text or a description of how a pump works just by pictures, neither are as effective or conducive to learning as when you simply put those together. Okay, so this is how we learn. And this is not how we create our PowerPoints, really, okay? Which brings me to a professor from Penn State University, Michael Alley, and a fantastic teacher who has looked at thousands of scientific presentations. And what he's come to understand is that, or learn about, is that most people that have complex statistical data that they need to present, if they use a form like PowerPoint, it really, the meaning of that data gets lost. Um, it's very hard to present things with the bulleted subtop topic, subtopic um, architecture. So he's developed this sort of template that he uses in his PowerPoints. And it's called an assertion evidence template. What he does is he takes a, a one sentence topic, two lines, 
uh, usually 40 point Calibri. And then under it, he puts up an image that supports that topic and um, makes meaning of that topic, okay? So as a, instead of this <clears throat> trying to understand this through bullets, the assertion evidence method sort of creates a different place of learning, right? So for me, you, you, you might have different ideas about this picture. The things that I start to think about are, you know, how hot is that blast? How much oxygen is being consumed by that blast? You know, what's the force of that blast at 50 feet? How far are those fragments flying? Um, these are the kind of things that I'm starting to think about as I look at pictures and words together. So it got me really interested in thinking about it this way and it brought me back to what I've learned at Teachers College in, in the field of educational technology, uh, educational psychology. <clears throat> and people like Benjamin Bloom who sort of was able to categorize thinking skills, how they um, build on one another, where the lower level thinking skill of knowledge is needed in order to comprehend something. And then comprehension is needed to be able to apply something, okay? And this has been revised by some of his students and others today. It's pretty much the same, except we now have uh, verbs instead of nouns. And the highest level thinking skill they feel is creating something opposed to evaluation. But it's mostly the same chart. So it got me thinking about um, this Michael Alley's work and the bulleted list. And I'm thinking, if as a student I am going to be given a series of slides like this, how am I to understand this and how am I to get anywhere above remembering? Is there anything in this slide to help me understand and not just try to remember the facts and figures? And I, I don't think there is. Um, I think that at best I will walk away remembering. I might not even remember it. So I think that I'm, those kind of slides are keeping people at this lower level thinking skills. Conversely, I think if I were given a slide like this, I could think about it in a different way, come up with my own ideas about the statement, and perhaps r rise up to maybe a level of understanding about this material, simply by putting a picture next to words, maybe even a, being able to apply what I learned from those pictures and words. So I think it, I think that, um, Pictures and words together, the assertion evidence method, sort of is a way of, that should be used more in education than in corporate world, where bullets might be fine. If you need to get across a few key points for your meeting, I think the bulleted slides work. If you're trying to teach about complex material, I don't know if the bullets are that effective, that maybe we need to look at um, creating our slides in a different way. So if we were to still use PowerPoint, which I think we should, there's just maybe we should just, there's a few simple ways that we could adjust our PowerPoints um, without doing much uh, to change them. So as Edward Tufte said, no amount of blinking or animation, if the content isn't there, um, nothing you do animated wise is gonna help. So maybe we should do away with the animations, at least the blinking. Um, we shouldn't use all uppercase. Again, based on our film, uh, based on our media literacy, we don't, uh, nothing else is in uppercase, so why should we create our slides in uppercase? It also, it seems like we're yelling at people in uppercase, right? Italics, um, like I said before, we use them for certain things, like uh, quotations. Why um, use too many italics when we have a literacy and we, we kind of know why we're using italics. And, or the same with underlining. I mean, these things are cognitively to draw attention and maybe shouldn't used haphazardly. <clears throat> um, I understand that as academics that you have a lot of material that you need to put into your slides and they can't just be, you know, very small, maybe one sentence. So why not just use color to sort of draw your audience away and to the things that you might want to get to later. And that's simply just using two colors instead of one. Um, always use a mix of uppercase and lower. I'm not going to read it. I'll let you read it. Sorry. I'm excited. I want you. But, but color, <clears throat> cognitively, color is always 
there to um, initiate some sort of change. When people see a change in color, they're looking for some change in content. So don't change a color unless something up on that slide that you want them to take notice of as a difference, as something salient. Okay, a lot of different colors, um, different fonts. Uh, actually, this is not. This is this was a more complex font, but on this machine, it's not showing. So disregard that. Um, cognitively, we always group things together with color. So be careful not to change colors um, for no real good reason, because people are going to start to group whatever is in that color together. And if you have a lot that you need to discuss. Maybe not all of it on one slide. Here we see that basically there are three main points. So why not just start with the three main points and work off of that instead of trying to uh, cover everything in one. Like I said, limited capacity. People aren't going to, people really aren't able to take in all this material at one time. So I think that PowerPoint, while it's a great tool, has some limitations. I think it's very rigid in its linearity. So if I needed to go back six slides or whatever, I have to take you back, which I think is not a really good way of presenting material, is taking you back and forth. I could get lost and then not know where I am. So I think that's a big um, <clears throat> problem with PowerPoint. And I also think another problem is it's, it's hard to collaborate, right? So if I have a PowerPoint, I need to give it to someone else, maybe on a flash drive. I have to hope they don't lose my flash drive. They're going to take the PowerPoint and add to it. They give it back to me. I have to wait. Um, collaborating with, in PowerPoint is sometimes arduous. So I thought that maybe we could look at some Web 2.0 alternatives that sort of um, address some of the limitations in PowerPoint if you wanted to venture off into the World Wide Web with some stuff. OK. So I made a presentation, and I'd like to use the presentation to talk about a few other tools. And I will do that in one of these tools. So this is a tool called Prezi. And I'll go into full screen mode here. So this is my, pro this is my Prezi presentation. And what I could do is kind of show you the whole presentation in one shot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about four limitations of PowerPoint and then four different tools that you could use to, um, to help with those limitations. So. <clears throat> so PowerPoint really lacks the ability to have any type of dialogue in the presentation. It lacks commenting. It lacks a, a place for discussion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool called VoiceThread. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's not easy to collaborate. Like I said, it's hard to share a PowerPoint file with a lot of people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Google, Google presentations and Google spreadsheets, a way that you could co uh, collaborate with your colleagues or have your students make presentations together. It's difficult for displaying textual, uh, conceptual info, right? The, the slide itself isn't really great for big uh, branches and hierarchical charts. So I thought that maybe we could look at um, a tool like MindMeister, where you could set up your whole presentation as a conceptual chart and open up different branches when you're ready to talk about them and close them after you're done. And like I said, it's very rigid in its linearity. So let's look at this tool here, Prezi. Has anyone um, used Prezi? Just a few people, right? So has anyone never seen Prezi? Great, OK. So Prezi is uh, a way of creating a presentation. The nice part about it is, as opposed to a bunch of slides that you have to work on, you really could, you just get one big canvas. And it's very easy to embed images here or text, or YouTube videos, or hyperlinks, all the things that you could put into a PowerPoint, OK? So you sort of position your pieces the way you want. And then you simply create a path, what you want to show first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And then Prezi just zooms in 
to a certain part of the presentation. You could always zoom back out and go back in wherever you want. So you could start your discussion in a zoomed out way. And if people had questions about something, you could just take them right back in. Um, it's really easy to use. It's free. It deals with the limitation of rigidity and PowerPoint. It's easy to embed images and movies. It's kind of fun, and I think it's really sharp looking. I kind of, I, I mean, sharpness shouldn't be the first thing, but it is a sharp looking way to, um, there's a lot of different themes, so you can make your prezies um, as big and complicated or as simple as you wanted them to be. So uh, let me take, a, let me show you a little bit about uh, VoiceThread. VoiceThread started as a, the real function of VoiceThread is it's sort of a social annotation tool. Like Facebook is a social networking tool and Flickr is a social image collection tool. VoiceThread was really a way that you could embed something like a JPEG or a video or a PDF file and people could, through commenting, start to annotate and talk about this particular artifact. So you could either add your comment as text, or you could add your comment wow. as audio. What an amazing. There's a drawing tool, so you could do combinations of text and drawing or audio and drawing, like these people are doing. And it would just go from commenter to commenter. And then this would be just one slide, so you could have a, a series of artifacts. Here you get to see them all. So they've decided to annotate five different artifacts. And people um, add to this discussion through commenting. Now, it's not hard to tweak this a little bit for education. So I have a great example here of how a professor has used VoiceThread to talk over his slides for a class that's all over the world. Uh, people log into his class and what Professor Griffin does here is he actually uses a video camera for his commenting. Now it's not as good as having Professor Griffin in the class, but it's it's good. It gives a sense that he has he's there, he's talking through a slide, which goes back to dual channel. So you get to hear what he thinks about these particular slides. What he did, which is nice, he could have left it as himself being the sole commenter, but he left the commenting on. So what happens is if you go through to another slide, you'll see that he's talking through this slide. You, you could always zoom in and look at the slide a little closer. But as he's talking about it, and then he uses the pen tool at some point, is going to influence the services, things like ecosystem functions. See that, could you see that line there? So he's using the pen tool to, to, to annotate this um, slide. At some point, though, his student has a question. So his student is able, to, as a comment, to add a comment um, and ask a question about this slide, at which Professor Griffin could then comment back to that person, answer the question, and then his other, his co-teacher, also asked, added a comment to answer her question. Yes? So this is this, like he's doing this and then it's being watched for say a year later. Yes. And then he then goes back to the and see the question. That's not in real time. No, it's not in real time. So, um, and it's very easily embeddable. So uh, a, a situation might be Professor Griffin creates this in, in VoiceThread, but then he just embeds it in his CourseWorks page. So his students don't even have to go to uh, VoiceThread. They go to CourseWorks, they play it, he makes it public, they comment and add their comments as they see it. He comes back two days later, he checks the comments, and he comments back. So you're right, it's not in real time, but um, in comparison to PowerPoint, where it would just be delivered to you as one file. I think that there, this is a way, if you wanted to take a little time, to um, either add comments with a microphone or a video camera. It's a great, easy, and free way to add a dimension to your presentations where you're actually inviting your students to add their own comments or questions that you might not be able to answer till perhaps the next week. Anyone have it? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there are alerts on the comments. I could be wrong. I'll have to check. That's a great question. Yes. You could have alerts. So you could be alerted when. Uh, yes. Well, well, this line, this is just him inputting a uh, inputting his voice, right? Oh, I got you. Could you type in Spanish? I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to my colleagues here, who say yes, you could set it for another language. That's an excellent question to be used in language classes, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Great. So this is VoiceThread. Um, it's one of the tools that. I'd be happy to talk to you with at a later date over at Butler if uh, you were thinking about using something like this in your class. A little, la a little later, I'll just show you some delivery methods, and I'll show you how easy it is to embed this in all kinds of different things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Media Thread is something that we created at, at CCNMTL, and. Um, it's a, a little bit like media thread, but it's a little media thread allows you for more types of things and uh, sure <laughs> be happy to talk to you about media thread too um, so why don't I um, move on to Google does anyone not have a Google mail account so everyone has almost everyone one person that's okay so um, everyone has a Google mail account which means that they have um, access to all the other tools of Google. And if you were to get a Google Mail account, which is free, you'd be able to access Google Maps and Google Docs and Google Sites, websites. All that is available with a simple and free uh, email account. So I have a, my center, we share a Google Docs account, right? So what it looks like, how it looks is, is that, does, has anyone not used Google pres presentations or Google Docs? A few people. Oh, okay, thank you. Michael is not Tucker. Right, sorry about that. So I'm gonna log in with my own. Oh. Sorry. I'll log in with my own uh, wind authentication because this is uh, a center's account. So I just put my uni. And it brings up all of my spreadsheets and my presentations and my Word documents and my drawings. If you go here to create new, you'll see that you have the ability to create any of these things. So I went and created a presentation, which is a little bit to show you a few more techniques in, uh, in Google. But it's just as easy to create a document or a spreadsheet. Now, these could be shared. Uh, with other people, which is a great part of, of Google. You could just share this with another person's Gmail account. Um, it's easy if you were to have, if you had a lot of PowerPoints already and you wanted to say, bring them into your Google account, it's really easy to upload your files, your, your PPT files, and you could bring them into Google presentations and continue to work on them in your Google account collaboratively, let's say, or by yourself, but you'd have them inside your account. I am going to open this Presentations 2 um, document, and it really looks like PowerPoint. So if you're used to PowerPoint, you should have no trouble using Google presentations. I, my colleague Michael is here. Um, I've asked him up here in the upper right. You'll see that Michael Preston is um, in this document and he's also editing and the orange box around the first slide means that he's doing some editing right now. And if I were to refresh my screen, are you done Michael? Oh, he's, he's doing it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michael has that. So what we have here is a presentation that could be worked on um, collaboratively, remotely, simultaneously. Google's very fast and, and it, it could see two people working on a, a document together with very little problems. There's no tracking, there's no um, people writing over each other. So, and it's a great way uh, 
for you to have students work on presentations, perhaps. You could have groups of students creating presentations, uh, working together, sending them to you, sharing them with you, or having them embed them right into your course wiki or your blog or your coursework site. It's really easy to do. Okay, so why, why don't I open this presentation? And it's very simple, just start presentation. Pretty much starts and opens just like a, uh, a PowerPoint. So why don't I continue with a few more do's and don'ts of presentations and in PowerPoint. So if you can't see that back in, in the back there, it's, it's a little too small. So always try to have your font size big enough so everyone can see. Uh, this is an actual background, so I don't know why you might want to use this background, uh, especially when your content is so important. So this idea of using the defaults again, I think they throw a few too many defaults in there. Okay, I don't really see the reasons for that. So why don't keep your art backgrounds as simple as they could be. I'll talk a little bit about graphs and charts, because they're the, uh, an, a very great way to show meaning through words and pictures, right? And in lieu of baseball season, I put up this little quote. And I thought, well, if Mr. Barrow had a, if Mr. Barrow were able to use statistics or have a graph, he might have seen the error of his way when he uh, was going to write or say that. So why do we like graphs so much and why are graphs so important? The graphs are great because they are able to show very complex data in a simple way, in the form of a picture and words. Right? And we, as humans, we sort of automatically see the larger wedges and the higher lines and the higher bars as, as, as having meaning, as being greater than. So they're just designed for us to understand. Right? We can understand so well by looking at a good graph. But again, like everything else, there are good graphs and bad graphs. Right? So we want to try to adhere. There's a lot of information on, on good graphs, but you know, what information is it that you want people to see? If it's only one piece, you know, let's keep all the other data off the graph for that particular slide, right? If we're looking at, if we want to create hierarchical charts and it's top down, you know, maybe space shouldn't be the first priority. If it's a top-down graph, maybe we need to create it top-down because it's harder to understand a graph if it's not going in the direction that you want it to go in. Exploding charts are great, but to have a whole chart exploding sort of takes away the purpose and meaning of the explosion, right? So one part of a chart should be exploded and not the whole chart. Right? And uh, backgrounds that are in charts really take away from the data, right? And a lot of people don't even think that 3D charts are really useful. A lot of people believe that the chart should be 2D w with the use of color to really show what you want, to, what you want people to take away from that chart. Um, t speaking of charts, I have another way to show data, not in a Google ch presentation, but which would be very, um, two-dimensional pictures, but what about a chart that might be able to have an element of time to it? So what I have also in my Google account, my Google Docs account, is I have a spreadsheet that has what's called a motion chart in it. And this is a simple and free tool in Google. And what I have, what this chart is, it's seven columns of data. I have um, by state, I have year, and I have unemployment on the um, vertical, and I have housing price index on the horizontal, but I also could incorporate time in here. So you, you actually could see these changes happening in time. What else is nice about this is I could actually, and these bubbles are different states, colors by different regions here on the right. What I also could do, which is really nice, is I could isolate, let's say, two states. So let's say I want to isolate New York and California for the purposes of, of, of showing some, some data, right? So I'm 
now I could isolate two states and and see how those two states have changed from 2002 to 2006. Now, I think that this is a really interesting way to present your data. And I think that you all could think of a lot of different ways that your data might be able to have more meaning or come alive with something as simple as a Google chart, a Google motion chart, okay? This is free and it's easy to embed and um, Any questions about Google? No? Okay. Uh, I, no, you could only take it out as a picture. So I could only take this picture out and I could embed the picture in Google. Google also is, to, just to, so we know, Google's not as robust as PowerPoint. It can't do a lot of the things you could do in PowerPoint, like uh, animations and things like that. But I think for educational purposes, we might want to veer away from that kind of those kind of things anyway so i think google presentations is a good way to to create a a, a presentation with words and pictures and and not much else yes since um, in powerpoint when you have only the picture that you're talking about present and then you add another one and then you add another one as you talk about them yes that's actually called animation ah and you can use sure Absolutely, sure. User controlled animation, maybe, right? So, yeah, that's a great, that's a great idea. Sure, you only, you can only talk about one at a time, and then based on you know limited capacity, why would you want to throw them all up at once for people? Sure, that's a great idea. Okay, okay, uh, and let me talk about um, MindMeister a little bit. And what time do we go till? Okay. So MindMeister is a way to present conceptual data. So let's say I've taken uh, I've taken this whole talk and I've sort of put it into a conceptual map. And if I wanted to, I sort of could talk about the different parts one at a time. So if I wanted to say, take one cognitive psychology in particular, like Stephen Coslin or Richard Mayer, we talked about his um, three assumptions of cognitive theory, which was the dual channel, limited capacity. I could sort of break them up this way and talk about each one individually, close it, move on to another one close it and sort of work my way through a presentation with these trees that allow me to just focus your attention on one part of this presentation. Again, I don't have to rely on the rigidity of PowerPoint in my slides. I could sort of go wherever I want at that moment. If someone wants to go back to the WebPoint to tools, I could just simply go right back and go right into the do's, um, what's good about Google presentations and what's good about spreadsheets and VoiceThread. So I think this is a nice, easy way for um, information to be conceptualized. Okay, you could actually add images to this if you wanted to, but this is a free service again, MindMaster, and it's easily embeddable in a lot of different uh, tools. So let me just show you. I have a coursework site here. have an MNE and ME course and I have in my syllabus I've created five sessions so I'll just go to detail view and I've actually embedded all these five tools into my coursework site and they all work inside of coursework so students can simply look at it here Hi, everyone. Well the presentation works just as well embedded in here motion chart works. And I could open and close anything I want in the map. Oh, sorry. And my Prezi. So I have all these tools that I could use 
inside my learning management system. Um, I have all these tools that I could use inside a wiki that I might want to create for my class or a blog that I want to have for my class. All these things are able, are very easy to use in other places. I think a big part of why a lot of teachers don't want to use some of these tools is, and this is rightly so, I don't want to have my students having to go to Courseworks and then VoiceThread and then Google Docs so this idea of consolidating these things into one place, I think, is, is great for the student, great for you. You don't have to go to a lot of different third-party places every day also. So um, any, any questions on the um, embedding of these tools or anything like that? Any ideas? MindMeister? Yes. No, you, but you could um, you could add you could add links to the MindMeister. So you could these could be hyperlinks out to web pages, um, but no, or they could be hyperlinked out to the wiki pages. I mean, I, this could be the front page of your wiki, and every page could be sort of mapped out with hyperlinks if that's sort of the case. I, I would con I might if the if the um, I've seen some mindmeisters in the biological sciences and the the way they were constructed um, were were very interesting I thought it would it, it was a good way to to show the interconnectedness and the hierarchical nature of different things in biology so I think you know with a little practice and imagination I think you could tailor this kind of thing to your own um, content sure. Yes. Are these tools collaborative tools? Yes, thank you. Um, every tool I've shown is collaborative. So you could collaborate on a Prezi together. You could share a Prezi. You could share a MindMeister map. You could share uh, the Google stuff. And the voice thread um, you could open to anyone for commenting. A and for actually for building. So any, if you were to um, share a voice thread with another person, they could add their own JPEGs or videos or whatever. There's a difference between commenting, sharing for commenting, and sharing for editing. But you could give anyone the editing functions in your voice thread. So as a way to students. Mm -hmm. Sure. But they, if you wanted, they could just be commenters. Or if you wanted them to add their own sort of artifacts, and say, if you have another JPEG you'd like to add, then you could give the, them ed editing privileges and they could add to the voice thread with more pictures or more videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I've got a general question. If you design a presentation um, that is going to employ more than one of the um, applications that you just mentioned, okay. and you put that into Courseworks, can that be accessed by someone outside of Columbia or not? So, for example, VoiceThread, yes. obviously anybody, um, if your students are on the other side of the country, they can still access it. Right. But if I put that into coursework, mm -hmm. and I have, I've got parts of my presentation uh, which is uh, utilizing VoiceThread, PowerPoint, as well as Google Docs, um, can that be accessed by someone outside of Columbia? Well, the VoiceThread could be public or private and private being just people that you invite. If you were to make it public, people could get to it from, their cor from your coursework site and have no problem, or everyone else, if they were to search for it, would find it. If you made it by invitation only and gave everyone in your class, emailed them an invitation, then you could have it work in Courseworks and only your students not due to courseworks, but due to the fact that you've just invited a number, a certain number of people, which are the same as your students. So they would only, they would be the only ones that have access to it. Does that answer the qu your question? Security by security. Yeah, and and secure, uh, security by obscurity. It might be difficult to find the voice thread on the open web, so maybe a lot of people wouldn't be able to get to it anyway, even if it were public. Okay. Right, but if they knew about it, they would be able to access it and then. Yes. Yes. 
I want to ask a, a more general question, drawing on our first presentation here this morning. He was talking about the dangers of multitasking and divided attention. Yes. And it's kind of a two-part question. I've heard students say that the best lectures they've heard don't have slides at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any evidence that improved slides, as we've discussed here today, actually are better than no slides at all. And separately, um, I often see lecturers talking over the slides, almost asking their students to multitask mentally, mm -hmm. listen to you or watch the slide. Comment on sure. This I, I think that is redundant. I think talking over the slides is um, forcing students to have to work too hard. And on the first part, sh I would rather sit in front of my instructor and, and listen to them speak, no doubt. But I think there are a lot of different scenarios where that either can't happen all the time, or an instructor might want to just provide maybe some supplemental materials, maybe maybe a pre-lecture PowerPoint to say, you know what, log into CourseWorks before Tuesday because I have a small presentation. I just wanted some thoughts that I'd like you to think about before I lecture. So it doesn't have to be an alternative to the lecture. It could be in a lot of different ways. It could be made as a sort of supplement. But that would suggest reading outside of the class, not slides. So I'm wondering if that qu brings into question the premise of this of, of that, that they're not as effective? Well, I, 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 I think... I'm just wondering if there's really a question to be raised, if there's evidence to suggest that this really does help, or maybe it doesn't. Right. I, I, I think it does. I think that... Um, I think learning happens better with words and pictures. Um, I think that... Uh, that's the premise. That, that's m what my research has said. I mean, I, I think that there's plenty of learning that could happen without slides, but I think that slides, if done correctly, I think are, are an advantage and, and help in the process. But not, maybe not too many, maybe not as a replacement, but no, I, I definitely believe that they are a better way to learn. I, I, think, that I, lear I think that we learn, um, I even think that the best books in the world that have no pictures are multimedia because those authors were able to get you to create those pictures in your own head. So I always think that we learn through words and pictures, whether we're imagining those pictures or whether somebody's giving us good ones to look at to compare with the text. Can I comment on the first part of that follow-up question? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's the biggest problem that I've, I've encountered. It's that it's uh, it's set up for those defaults, and I think it um, like all. I think that in a way we're a bit addicted to the defaults because they're so easy, and everyone uses them. So I wanted to actually close by saying that if there's any group that I could think of that is capable of thinking of ways to break those addictions and defaults of PowerPoint, it's the group I'm talking to right now. I would love to see a group like Columbia faculty learn and try to figure out ways to break that dependency on PowerPoint, whether it's to just decide never to use the defaults or to look at design in a different way and try to put design elements into their PowerPoints. I just think that it's so possible with this group that I would love to be able to see that happen in, in the future where some group has really decided to say that their information 
their experiences and their stories are way better and more valuable than the tool that they're using. And like I said, it's why we all have come here, to hear your stories <clears throat> and not use the tools. Or the tools should be helping and not hurting. I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much for your time. <laughs>